We are continuing on in a series that we have called Royally Messed Up. We've spent weeks in it. We're going to finish that series next week. And so we're kind of uh, winding it down, coming to our conclusion as we've looked through uh, the story of the kings of God's nation, Israel, uh, and what we'll find out today, what becomes two nations, Israel and Judah. And so let's, let's pray. And then what I'm hoping to do today is take where we left off last week, which was the end of Solomon's life, and travel to the end of the kingdom. And so if you know a little bit about your Bible, we're going to try to cover a lot of ground uh, and, and do that. It's going to be heavy, dense, a lot of material, but I think it'll be good for us, uh, and we'll, we'll try to move through it uh, efficiently and for the sake of God's glory. All right, so pray with me. Lord, we are we're thankful to be here, thankful for uh, you bringing your body, the church, together, and uh, all of us able to spend time worshiping and delighting in you and the truth of your word. And even as we look at the brokenness of humanity as it works its way out through history, that it would ultimately bring glory and praise to your name. And that uh, we would see in all things, in sin and evil and brokenness, that you reign supreme. And that we can trust you and we can praise you and we can press into your grace because of who you are, not because of who any of us are. And so help us to see the truth in that. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. When, I, um, when we first got married, Whitney and I, we rented a house for a few months uh, and, and decided pretty quickly that we wanted to try to buy a place of our own. And so we started looking for houses. And Whitney's, Whitney's mom at the time was a real estate agent. So she's showing us houses. And uh, before too long, we find this house that was uh, foreclosure, kind of broken down. It had a lot of things going wrong with it. Uh, and it was kind of just our style. And so uh, we said, okay, let's buy this one. We'll try to fix it up a little bit. Uh, I was I'm still getting a little better, but not like a super handy person. And so uh, we, we buy this house and we're like, we'll just kind of learn as we go. And so we start doing some things. But uh, really, my wife is like the driver's seat of how to get projects done, uh, or at least how to inspire me to get projects done. Uh, and so she, she kind of has the list of things that need to happen, that she's convinced are going to happen. And, and normally, there's like an over-under, maybe like six or seven times that she asks about a particular thing. And, and then eventually, I get the hint and go, okay, I'm going to get that one done next because it seems like the priority is increasing. Husbands, you with me? You understand how that works, right? Uh, and so <laughs> a couple of us, the honest ones. All right, so in this, uh, we're in this first house. We've been there about a year, and Whitney left to go get groceries one day. And, and at that point in my life, when I was younger and not as seasoned as I am now, normally that was like a... a cue for me to be able to just sit and watch sports on TV until she got back, and then right when she got back, looked like I was real busy. But this particular day, I felt a little more ambitious and uh, faithful in that, and so I knew there was a project that needed to get done. And so our, our front, like, porch area was this concrete porch. Uh, it had a pretty big step down, and, and you know how normally they have those, like, concrete steps that go in there, right? Like, uh, and, and so apparently in this particular house, whether that one broke or what, it just wasn't there. Instead, it was replaced with uh, patio pavers, like the one inch thick 12 by 12 pavers, and they're just stacked up. And so there was like a stack about four high, and it's about four wide, 15, 16 pavers, and they're, uh, they were kind of cracked and broken, and they looked really, really poor. Um, I thought they looked completely sufficient. My wife would tell you they looked very poor and need to be replaced. And so uh, she leaves to go to the grocery store, and I decide that I'm going to surprise her. I had really great intentions that I would, I would get these out of there, uh, and then I was going to go get the concrete step, the actual good one, and put it in its stead, and she'd come back, and it'd be like, oh, the transformation while you were gone. And so I go out there, and uh, I grab the first kind of couple pavers, and I'm, I'm sort of just moving them out of the way. I'm just going to get them in the driveway and take care of things there. And I get like three, four pavers in, and from in between the cracks of the pavers, between the foundation of the house and where they're butted up, out comes, and, and, and like fast, out comes a snake. And like, there's a reason that's what Satan impersonated. I'm not like complete snake hater, but man, oh, and it, put them in an aquarium or something, and then they're fine, uh, but I don't really want to be near them, uh, especially like 
bare hand. It's coming. I was like, no way, right? So I back up and I, I kick at the pavers and hurt myself. And then uh, the snake fires back down in between the same pavers that he came out from. And so now there's a problem and, and I'm not really sure what I'm going to do, right? Because I'm not going to stick my hand back down there. Like, I'm not, I'm just not that masculine of a person. And so uh, I was like, well, I got to figure out something to do. And so I look into the garage and am trying to kind of, kind of look for some type of solution. Uh, and I find like a shovel and I'm, I'm thinking I can kind of pry them with the shovel. And as I'm moving them, moving the blocks with the shovel, trying to find the snake, I can hear the snake hissing, right? Like, just make it, I, I don't know, I, to me it sounded like a rattle, but you know, that's debatable, right? But I can hear like making noise, and so I'm, I'm kind of like fearful, angry, not really sure. I don't know if it's got like a six foot strike distance or what, but I, social distancing before it was even cool. And so I like go back into the garage, and what I find is a can of gasoline, and I'm like, this is going to solve my problem. And so I take it and I pour the gasoline in the brick paver cracks there. And I take a match and I light it. Boom! You know, and it, and it works, right? Okay, so it worked very well. The snake is gone, like out of the bro- blocks, like heading towards the neighbor's yard. Uh, I still have the shovel in my other hand. And so there was three snakes real soon, uh, you know. Ah! Right? But... And so, like, in my head, the problem is solved relatively quickly. And so I, like, turn to look back at my house. Now, uh, some of you might know this. It, in the, the house was built in the early 90s, and they went through this phase where when they were laying foundations, instead of doing, like, just concrete foundations, they took these, like, hollow styrofoam blocks and they filled the insides with concretes, but then like the outside of your house foundation was actually styrofoam with just like a real thin like mortar veneer over it because it insulated the house really well. Except that styrofoam is pretty flammable, apparently. And so I turn around and I look and my house is on fire. And, I, and I'm like, oh no. And so I look back in the garage to like my resource bin, right? And there is a, a bucket of water from when I had washed the cars uh, earlier that week. And so I run and I grab the bucket of water and I quickly throw it on the fire. Now, one thing you might not know about gasoline fires that you're about to learn, I don't put them out. Water doesn't do anything to put out a gasoline fire. In fact, it kind of like fired it up a little bit more, just made it angry at me. And so I'm like trying to take the blocks away from the house because I need to access where I'm about to burn my house down. And, and then I'm trying to find some type of other solution. But I, I do have a shovel. And so uh, very quickly, I run out into the yard and I begin to shovel into the said now empty bucket as much dirt as I can, thinking I'll get this. And so then I, I take a whole bucket, five-gallon bucket full of dirt, and I'm, I'm smashing the dirt onto the side of the house, like, you know, and, and it's slowly like putting the fire out little by little by little and, and kind of kicking it. And I think eventually I had a towel and like beating it down and everything. And, and, and so after all of this, I look, and there, there is just burnt styrofoam all over our basement foundation wall. There are patio pavers just everywhere. There's dirt, like, anywhere you can possibly imagine. It's mud, because I'd also thrown a ton of water in there. And like a dead snake laying over here and a shovel on the ground. And the whole interaction had really wore me out, so I just left it and went back inside. And, and thought, I, if I fix all of this, I will not be able to explain it to Whitney when she gets home. So she better just see this seen. Needless to say, uh, it was not the like peppy response that I might have expected, uh, but rather quite a bit of confusion and a little disillusionment. And, and I remember thinking, <laughs> I know, I know, right? But I remember thinking sometimes, sometimes things that can start off so promising just have a way of spiraling further and further out of control in our life. Do they not? Uh, Chances are you have interactions, stories, times in your life where something that uh, started off in a way that you thought was completely under control just had a tendency to grow further and further away from what you originally intended it to be. I think that would be a valid description of the nation of Israel, God's people. You see, 
Uh, God had promised, he called out this man named Abram, promised him a land and descendants of his own for the sake of his glory. He said, I'm going to make you a distinct people so that all the peoples of the earth will know who I am through you. And then, after a whole bunch of different things, highs and lows and things happen, they actually become this nation. And what we've looked at over the last few weeks is that in time, this nation has grown and prospered in ways that they might have never even imagined just a few generations before. A king named David comes in who's a man after God's own heart and God goes so far as to promise him that someone from his line will sit on the throne, the kingdom of the earth, forever. And things are looking really good. David passes the kingdom on to his son Solomon who happens to be the wisest man who ever lives. And it says that Solomon is not only wise for his own sake, but over the course of his life, Israel becomes prominent, they expand their territories, they make peace with all of their enemies, and not only is Solomon wealthy and extraordinarily uh, in excess of anything he needs, but the whole of the nation is doing well financially, the economics look good, uh, everything seems relatively promising. And then quickly, things begin to spiral out of control. We looked at last week how this happens in Solomon's life. Uh, Today, I want to summarize from 1 Kings chapter 12, when Solomon dies and passes off the kingdom, all the way through the end of 2 Kings. Now, if you know a little bit about your Bible, 1 and 2 Chronicles covers that same time frame too. They're just kind of mirrored books of history. And through this, the Bible is going to list just king after king after king after king. Now, I thought about kind of taking week by week going through this, but I think it would be an exhaustive idea. Here's what I want you to just see in a broad scope, that something that started off looking really good begins to spiral worse and worse and worse and worse into things that are almost unimaginably evil and broken. Now, I'll give you this caveat. I'm going to write a lot of it on the marker board. If you're a note taker, you can go along with this and kind of keep it. Uh, If in the course of this, over names and dates and locations and who's where and what's doing, what's happening and all these things, you're like, man, my head is spinning. This is so much content. I get it. Right? This is my job to do this, and it was hours this week trying to chart together all of the timelines and the people and remind ourselves of whose names they are. And, and not only, it's not like normal names like Bill and Fred, but they all have like basically the same iteration of the different name, you know, and so you're trying to put all these things together. So, yes, stick with me, all right? And I have notes because it's intense. Here's, here's essentially what happens. Solomon dies, and two guys show up on the scene. The first is named Jeroboam. He was alive during Solomon's reign. He had been exiled out of the kingdom when Solomon was there because of some prophecy. We looked at it this morning in Sunday school, actually. Solomon's son... Rehoboam is appointed heir to the throne. Now Jeroboam shows back up when Rehoboam arrives as the son who's going to take over and Solomon is out of the picture and says, hey, let's do this thing together. You make my life easy and we'll uh, go forth. And Rehoboam listens to some wrong people. He says, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to make it even harder than your father was. And so Jeroboam and his people divide. And so what was one kingdom is now two kingdoms. In the north, you have, if you know a little bit about your history, 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel. They leave, and they say, we're going to form our own nation, and Jeroboam is going to be our king. Not only that, their nation is evil and idolatrous. Jeroboam helps in that, decides that it would be too dangerous for his people from the north to travel to the south and worship God like they should at the temple in Jerusalem, and so he builds fake temples in uh, does so with the intention of going, it's all the same, you worship here instead. Not only that, if you know a little bit about your history, the affront to God that this is, he puts at the centerpieces of those temples golden calves and says, worship here, offer your sacrifices here, it'll be exactly the same. And so right away, the ten tribes in the north walk away from the worship of God as they should. Now Rehoboam in the south, as you may have guessed, based on the way that the nation split apart, is not much better. He's evil in his own right and does not follow or walk with the Lord uh, all of the days of his life, yet God spares for him two tribes. Now, watch what happens 
in the north first, and then we'll come back to the south. Jeroboam dies. His son, Nadab, takes over the throne. Does not last very long. In fact, God has promised Jeroboam, because of his evil against the Lord, his son won't last very long, and he will no longer have a line in the inheritance of the throne. He's killed by a guy named Basha. Basha takes over, reigns for a while, about 20-something years. He's also evil, does not follow the Lord. Uh, eventually, he's going to die, and his son, Elah, is going to take over. And it's the same story again, that because of Basha's evil, Elah's reign only lasts about a year. He's killed by his servant, Zimri who has a really special distinction. I was talking to Kurt about it a couple weeks ago. He's the shortest reign in kingship of all the kings. He only makes it a week because he has murdered the sitting king on the throne. The armies find out about it, and they come in and lay siege to the city where he's at, and he decides the best thing for him to do is just set fire to his whole building and kill himself. Now, after he is gone, they take a divided kingship. There's Tib. Tim D, Tidney, something like that. But he doesn't last very long, about a month. Doesn't really matter. Omri takes over. This guy also evil, just a different kind of evil than the ones before him. However, there's a phrase that continues to come up in the scriptures at this time. It is that he does evil in the sight of the Lord, more evil than any of those who came before him. And so what's happening is not only is evil progressing in the kingdom of God, but it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Omri makes it nine, ten years. He has a son, and this one you might no, his name is Ahab. Ahab takes over. He's even worse than his father was and even more and more evil than the kings before him. If you're not really sure who Ahab is, he gets married. Yeah, who is it? Jezebel, right? Who's actually uh, quite problematic in her own right. Now, all of this, eventually Ahab reigns like 21 years. We'll talk more about him in a second. But he dies, gives the throne over to his son, and First Kings ends there. Now, meanwhile, in the south, same thing is happening, just in some different ways. Rehoboam gives the kingdom over to Abijam, who only makes it a couple years. Now, the one distinction is there's a king named Asa who comes in. He lasts like 40 years, happens to be a good king, does right by the way of the Lord, makes it through all of this chaos here, and eventually, when he dies, is able to give the kingdom over to his son, Jehoshaphat. Now, Jehoshaphat also wants to follow the Lord. This is the end of 1 Kings. See how we're moving here? Also wants to follow the Lord. However, he's going to make a mistake uh, in doing so, which is a desire. I think, I think probably from good intention, but his desire is that he would unite the two kingdoms that have since been divided. And so out of this, Jehoshaphat ends up getting his child to marry the child of Azariah, the grandchild of Jezebel and Ahab, so that they can unite the kingdoms. Now, as second king begins, here's what happens. The kingdoms do get united. We're carrying this over. I'll let you, yeah. I was going to say I'd let you take a picture of this at the end, but you're not going to be able to read my writing. So just, just try, all right? So in the north, a guy named Jehoram becomes king. In the south, a guy named Jehoram becomes king. It is so hard to spell and talk for me. I don't know. Maybe you guys think it's easy. Same guy. One guy. Here's what happens. The, the north and the south are united for a short period of time. The problem is, leading up to this through Asa and Jehoshaphat, the south is still interested in serving the Lord, and the north has no interest in that. They've turned further and further and further away from it through Ahab and Jezebel. Azariah hasn't done much to change this. And so in all of this, you have godly and ungodly mixed together. It does not go very well. Ungodly wins out. And then in the north comes a guy who is 
murderous and evil, but used by God named Jehu. In fact, his whole commission is to come in and cleanse out all of this. He murders literally everybody, kills them all, is done with it, but then does not do right by the sight of the Lord on his own. Instead, uh, lives evil in his own right. In the south, meanwhile, you have Ahaziah the second. See how it's kind of tricky because same name, not the same guy, taking over. Jehu does not do right by the Lord, and so here's how the north kind of progresses from here, right? You have Jehoahaz to Jehoahash. See where where I'm going with this? The writing's getting worse, too. To Jeroboam, again, not the same guy, obviously, but Jeroboam the second, and then things get really crazy because everybody starts killing each other, and you got a guy named Zechariah to Shalom to Menahem. It's just getting to Pekka, Haya, Pekka, and Hosea. Yeah. And then, okay, so it just goes down, 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 and down. Of the last nine kings in the northern king of, kingdom of Israel, four of them are killed by their successor. The other ones, not really doing that well. All in all, there's 18 kings in the nation of Israel over the course of this 245-year history. All of them do evil in the sight of the Lord and progressively more evil than the king before them. So much so that eventually Pekah, one of the last and evil kings, brings into alliance against the nation of Israel, against the nation of Judah, a desire to see things go forth. And so he calls the nation of Egypt to come and to fight with them against Judah. Judah responds by making an alliance with Assyria, and Assyria moves into the nation of Israel and they never leave. And shortly after that, in 722 BC, they exile out the rest of the northern tribe of Israel that has not already been killed and the nation in and of itself comes to an end. It's over. 722 BC, there is no more nation of Israel. From that point forward, it would be referred to as Samaria. Now, in the south... It's not much better. You see, uh, over the time, they're basically the same thing. Uh, Ahaziah, when he dies, is uh, taken over the throne. His his mom, Athaliah, right? Athaliah. And in order to make sure that she can secure the throne, she kills all of the descendants that uh, are not hers and takes over, reigns for like 10 years. However, one of them is hidden, grows up, survives. His name is Johash. If you're like, we already had that name. Yes, we did, right? And then Amaziah, Azariah. There's an Ahaz in there. All the same basically names again and again and again. Here's here's basically the only difference in this. Nearing the end, when Israel is being overthrown and ended, there's something that happens a little differently in Judah. There's a king that's raised up named Hezekiah who wants to do right by the Lord. He dies. His descendant does not. Another king is raised up named Josiah, wants to do right by the Lord. He dies. The kings that follow him do not. And so occasionally... The only difference between Israel and Judah is an occasional desire to see someone come and do right by the Lord to revive what it means to know and follow the Lord. And all in all, it ends up continuing them on as a nation for some hundred years longer until eventually, in 586 BC, the nation of Babylon comes in overthrows the nation of Judah, destroys them, uh, kills who they do not take into exile, tears down the temple, burns down anything of no value to it, and the nation of Judah comes to an end as well. And so all of this begins as we started this series in about 1200 BC with Saul of Tarsus, or Saul of uh, the Benjaminite, and then moves on through David, Solomon, and then uh, 18 kings in the north, 19 kings in the south. The bulk of them 
not interested in doing anything godly at all. And by 722 and 586 BC, both nations, which once looked so promising and strong and God-glorifying, are gone. Ended. Over. Done. And, and along the way, there is betrayal and murder and adultery and evil and evil and evil and evil just on top of more and more evil. And so you go, well, what are we, what are we meant to learn about all this? This just seems so messed up. Hence the name of the series, right? And so, so here's, here's where I think we go with this. Uh, over the course of all of this messed up history, I think there's some things that God means to tell us about what his people are meant to look like, meant to know, and meant to understand. All right, so, so I just want to go over three of them today, and then we'll spend most of our time talking about that next week. But uh, let me just give you a preview of what all this is meant to mean to us today. Because I think sometimes you can read through the Old Testament, especially through the history narrative of the Old Testament, and go, why is God telling us all of this? And not only that, why aren't God's people more interested in actually knowing and following God? Amen? And so, so in this, here's, here's three things. Here, here's number one. Uh, I think it should teach us to recognize that systems and structures, governments, societies, in and of themselves, are evil and they're broken. And sometimes they perpetuate the brokenness all around them. You see, what it was happening in the nation of God's people is because of one generation after another generation after another generation of evil, the evil was infecting more and more. And sometimes, even the people of innocence and nobility in it were causes of or affected by the injustice of the whole of the society around them. Uh, there's a story in the midst of this, uh, up in the north, right in this area of time, about a guy. He's an innocent guy. Uh, his name, Naboth, uh, is just some random person who happens to own a field next to the king's land. And so Ahab goes to Naboth and says, hey, I want to take your field. Not buy it, I want to take it. And Naboth goes, no, I'm not going to just give you my field. That's unethical. It's wrong. I'm not okay with that. And so uh, Ahab is disappointed and upset that he doesn't get this land that he really had his eye on and wanted as the king. And so at dinner, Jezebel sees him and goes, hey, what's making you all blue in the face, right? And he's like, oh, this guy won't give me his land. <laughs> Seems like a kind of petty, whiny thing. Uh, but Jezebel goes like this, oh, that's all the problem is? I'll take care of that. She writes a letter, sends it off, says, find two worthless men who will testify lies about Naboth and have him stoned to death. And you know what they do? They find two worthless men who testify about Naboth and have him stoned to death. And lo and behold, where does his land end up? Well, it ends up with Ahab the king. Nowhere in the scripture does it say that Naboth does anything wrong, anything unethical, anything unwise to deserve such a reality. It's just that sometimes on this earth, justice doesn't reign supreme. Amen? We know this about our lives, that there are contexts and situations and things that just seem so broken and wrong. And even as you do what is right, it does not always on this earth work out to your benefit. In fact, uh, I think this is part of the reason when Jesus prays and teaches us how to pray, he says, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because it's not always done that way on earth. Sometimes it's broken and sometimes injustice reigns. And I think for a believer, we ought to know that and to see that and to not have such a simplistic view of theology that says, if I do right, great things are going to happen to me in this life. Because they won't. The Bible promises you that they won't. And, and so we instead are meant to be a people who would remain steadfast and hopeful, knowing that the Bible does not promise you justice in this world, but justice eternally. It promises that God will make things right for the sake of his glory in the eternal sense, not here and now always. But there's a second thing, because, uh, and we'll, we'll talk more about this this, this coming week, but uh, I think a lot of times we, we want to 
blame things or uh, discount or write off things in a fatalistic way as to the evil and brokenness of the society or the systems or the structures around us without recognizing the second point, which is that it's people, not just systems and structures that are evil and broken. And without God's intervention, they'll pretend, will, will tend to pursue this evil more and more and more and continuing to do so. You see, uh, I think fatalistically we can go, oh, well, the whole thing is broken, and if I was in those situations, I wouldn't do this. And yet, uh, the Bible teaches us and shows us over and over and over again that with each new generation stands a new leader, a new king, a new queen with the opportunity to do what is right in the sight of the Lord. And in Israel, 18 of them show up, and not one of them does. In Judah, uh, only a few happen to do so, and every generation subsequent to them is marked by one that does not. That we, you and I, are broken. You and I are sinful. You and I make mistakes, do wrong, are evil in the nature of our humanity, and it leads to further and further brokenness. And unchecked, it spirals out of control. That's what our life is. So, so what's the last thing or the, the most important piece in all of this? Well, uh, while God doesn't ordain this evil, he uses it. He uses it for the sake of his glory. Here's the prevailing truth in the context of the downfall of the nation of Israel and the downfall of the nation of Judah. It's that God is at work bringing about his glory and the sake of his name being lifted up over and over and over again. My, my very favorite one, let me, let me read this text to you. Uh, along the way, right in this area here, Israel, the nation, has been exiled and destroyed. They're gone. The south, Judah, has looked up at them and thought, well, certainly uh, we need to make some changes. They kind of go back and forth in this. I mentioned a guy named Hezekiah who uh, is ready to revive the temple worship services. He dies. His son takes over and he's evil. His grandson takes over and he's evil. And then his great-grandson, uh, Josiah, takes over and does the same thing. Wants to resurge, revive the temple. Wants to get things back on track. Right during that time period is a prophet. His name is Habakkuk. And Habakkuk looks upon the scene and sees the people and sees the brokenness and the evil, not just in the leadership, not just in the government, not just in the structures, but in the individuals as well. And he calls out to God, really in frustration and complaint, and goes, how long, God? How long are you going to let this stand? How long will you allow such injustice to reign? Why aren't you fixing this? What's wrong with the world? Same question we ask today. God, if you're out there, if you're real, if you're doing this, why? Why? Why this evil? Why this sin? Why this brokenness? How could all of this be here if you indeed are good God? And here's how God answers Habakkuk. He says, look. Look among the nations. Observe. Be astonished. Wonder. Because I'm doing something in your days. You would not believe it if you were told. You see, uh, that verse is well known in Christianity. The verse that is not is the one that's very next. He says, For behold, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, that fierce and impetuous people who march throughout the earth to seize dwelling places which are not theirs. 586, the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, same people group, come in to the land of Judah, march throughout destroy, kill, and exile out the rest of God's people. Doing something in your days to bring about justice. Now, Habakkuk stammers back and goes, that's not the justice that I was looking for. That's not the righteousness that I wanted to come in. That you're going to bring a nation in to judge us, kill us, destroy us, and make things right and new. And yet it's exactly what God does. And he does so with the promise that though he will take this nation from them, that after 70 years he will return them to it. And again, it's exactly what God does. Here's the beauty of how God works in an evil and broken and sinful world. 
He doesn't ordain that evil and brokenness and sin. And then he comes right alongside and works in it for the sake of his glory. And for you and I, we ought to recognize that as the greatest news you can ever imagine because here's what happens. Some 600 years later, a new kind of evil has arrived. An evil that's described in the Bible in Acts chapter 4. It says, An evil gathered together in this city, Jerusalem, against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do what your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. What was it that God allowed, ordained, predestined to occur by evil hands like Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and the evil leaders of Israel? It was the death of Jesus. You see, the greatest news that God gives us is that through the sin and evil and brokenness of mankind, he sent his perfect Savior to be the one who would live a life without sin, one who would live a life unbroken, a one who would live without evil, the only one truly innocent. And God took and poured out the guilt that was yours and the guilt that was mine upon him on a cross as he had always intended for the sake of his glory. So here's where we're left with hope as you read and go, why? Why all this brokenness? Or as you look out upon the world around us, you go, why? Why all this sin? Why all this brokenness? Or as you look into your own life, you go, why? Why all this sin? Why all this brokenness? Because God is at work in all of that, bringing forth the glory of His grace and the glory of His name through Jesus Christ. Pray with me. God, I pray that we would recognize your goodness along with your grace and your mercy in a world that can feel so broken, so evil, so messed up. So often it can feel like it is spiraling out of control. Worse and worse and worse. Not only that, Lord, to add on to it, this is true of our own lives. Seems like so often in my life, the harder I work to get things in order, the further I am from what I should be. And yet, in the midst of all of it, like it did with God's people, like it did with the promises of Israel and Judah, like it does in the fulfilled promise of Jesus, you come right into it and you are at work. And your grace overcomes. And again and again and again, your grace and your mercy is more. So I pray that we are a people who rejoice in that this morning. I pray that we're a people that find our hope in that, not in systems of justice or temporal things, but that our whole trust would be on you, the one who overcomes for our sake. Lord, I pray that you would bring us to be a people that have faith in you and you alone for the sake of the glory of your name the name of Jesus. Amen.